My name is Karen Yuke. I work at WormBase, which is one of many mod, uh, model organism databases. Um, and today I'm going to tell you about a project we just launched uh, called Micropublication Biology. It's a new journal. But before I go into that, let me just tell you a little bit more about the model organism databases. Um, I think people don't understand these as much as uh, they should, of course, uh, from my standpoint point of view. Um, I'm a curator, which means that I take papers that are published and extract data. I find it, extract it, annotate it, and we put it into this database where it's publicly available to everybody. Um, we are not a repository. The, we are actually active members of the whole scholarly communication pipeline. Um, so today's talk is going to be about micropublication biology, which is looking at, which is actually transforming a little bit of how all the players in scholarly communication kind of take on new roles. So we're hoping to just change that whole um, cycle a little bit and the roles that people play. So uh, don't get too mad. I oversimplified a lot of stuff here and I know there's people from all of these different um, categories and you're probably looking at it and saying, hey, I do more than that. But it's just kind of, I'm making a database level uh, entity where I know that we're misunderstood. Um, so let me tell you a little bit more about the model organism databases. Uh, the mods, I'm going to call it mods for short. Uh, there are six mods that are anointed by NIH to be model, organism, database, model organisms, and we have a database for each one. We do more than just store data. We actually actively take in publication, uh, data from publication. We create our own uh, data through genome analysis, and then we pump it back out into the cycle. So, but. All that stuff does require a manual curation, which is incredibly expensive, and you can't get away from human effort. We've tried, other people have tried, you can't automate us out of a job. But you can make our jobs a lot easier. We cannot keep up with the amount of publications that are coming out per year. This is just for C. elegans field alone. Worm base, I forgot to mention, focuses on the nematode um, C. elegans, cerebralized <coughs> elegans. Um, and it's, it's kind of a piddly amount of papers compared to other organisms, like the mouse and the, and the rat field, but it's, it's still too much for curators to handle. So not all of, the data that get, all of the data that gets published can make it into our database. So that's one problem. The other thing is, for every paper that's published, there's a lot of data that's lost. I think you all know that as somebody does their research, they do a lot of experiments. Each little uh, oval there might represent an experiment. But by the time they get to the paper, you know, things have to get thrown out, right? There's, there's uh, word limits and things that just aren't very exciting, and the journals just say, take it out, or reviewers say, we, that's not necessary. So by the time it gets to the article, things are lost. There's also other things that don't even make it to article stage, right? Standalone data, you know, some grad student came in, did something cool, left, nothing happens. So there's a lot of data that gets lost. So how do we capture that data? Um, and then the next step is curation um, at the databases. We can't capture all the data that comes through a paper. So how do we deal with that? Um, well, one fantasy of my boss is that authors curate their data. So as they're making their data and writing their paper, they use machine-friendly language. They put it into a curatorial form that's um, trans um, that can be used and in, in, interoperable in many different systems, but that doesn't take care of it, and we know that they're not going to do that. Well, just wait, though. The other thing is, we meet authors, if they had smaller nuggets, maybe they would be able to do that. And this is where micropublication comes into play. So can we actually get authors to do this? Uh, can we get them to publish data that would otherwise main, remain unpublished, and can we get them to curate their data? Um, and what I'm telling you right now is, yes, we can. Um, this is our site and our peer-reviewed journal. Uh, we ask for single experiment um, results. Each thing that goes through peer review and is accepted uh, gets a DOI. Um, the data submitted is through pre-designed forms. So we walk the authors through curation-minded um, forms. The data is incorporated upon uh, acceptance into our database. So that step is tied together now. Um, there's also no submission form, no submission charges, and um, it's very fast. 
because it's really tiny. So I'm going to walk you. I'm going to just show you the submission forms. Walk authors through these things. I'm going to do this really fast because as an author, you're like, wow, this is really fast, and it's easy. <laughs> you know, I just pick this, I choose that, boom, and we get an article, and and we get an article out of it. Uh, Coco right now is building our platform, so they're making all that stuff even easier and faster. Um, and much more pretty. What we had before, you know, it's uh, in a little bit, uh, yeah, we won't dwell on it. Uh, so, yeah, out of the submission form comes an article. Uh, the article is sent for peer review, and reviewers can be, we're opening that up because there, there's going to be a lot more articles, we hope, and, um, and they're really short and small. The reviewers can be postdocs or senior graduate students. Uh, and so uh, we're opening it up to a bigger pool, and the reviewer gets credit if they want. So only a few reviewers have asked for not to be anonymous, um, but for the most part, they're getting some kind of credit. Uh, but if they don't, then we do put them on the article. And the other thing is we also put it into the database, and we can put it on the article when that will show up online. Okay, so the data goes into the database. It gets integrated with like data. You can find it. It's actually free advertising for journals, um, so and for us. Um, and what I can say right now is this is working. So we've been uh, live for a couple of years. Only the last year we really ramped up a bit. We have 53 micro publications published. We don't accept absolutely everything. Things do not pass through peer review. Um, luckily, most of it is good data, so most of it did get published. Um, four are retracted. Uh, we still have some community work to uh, you know, tell people what these things are. And eight um, are in the works. I think that actually has raised, we got a couple more submissions in the last couple days. Okay, so the average turnaround time is less than a month. Uh, we have, you know, the fastest turnaround time is eight hours. That's paper out to review, paper back to authors saying fix this, paper back to us saying we fixed everything, and uh, onto the web with the DOI, because DataSite is so awesome. The other thing is that we are expanding. So like I said before, this comes from, it started with Wormbase. The Worm community was a beautiful place to start because we are all very community oriented. Um, we are part of an alliance now with other databases. NIH told us to all work together. If you ever thought rats and worms could work together, well, you're looking at it. So we are slowly expanding. The worm field is um, Fly people are really hard to nail down, but <laughs> they are starting to give us publications. We're having trouble getting the reviewers, but it's all right. Um, the other thing is there are non-alliance people, non-alliance mods, or mod non-alliance databases that want in. So we have the frog field now hopping up to join us. <laughs> and we have some other, uh, other groups that are really waiting, that are interested. So we'll be working on bringing those in soon. OK, so what I can tell you is that our community does love us. They love the system. They're, they just think about it and like, oh my gosh, there's so much work just sitting there that's just lost. Um, the submissions are really quick. The DOI is bona fide citation they can use. The reviewer is public and gets acknowledged. So we are training a whole new generation of people into the scholarly communication cycle. Uh, the data is discoverable like with like data at Wormbase. And will be, you know, the fly data will be available in Flybase. Uh, there's no submission charges again. It, you know, like I said, publishing turnaround is fast, and they know and trust us to get into PubMed. Um, the other thing that's really great about this is that our community is driving it. So when we started, we're thinking, okay, what is the easiest data type uh, for somebody to enter data into? And we started with expression. You just have to have a picture, a really nice, pretty picture. You know, what did you use? You know, and some, you know, time points and whatever you know about the experiment, like when it was, how, when, when in um, life stage things were expressed, etc. So it was pretty easy. So we started with that. But quickly, people said, "Well, actually, I have all this 
mutant characterization. I'd rather give you phenotype data. We don't have an expression pattern. We don't have a pretty picture, but we have this other data. So we expanded to include that. And now we are at um, all these other data types. So we've quickly found other people like, well, I don't have expression data, but I have, you know, I did this genetic screen. It's not going anywhere. If a student did it, can you take it? You know, I, I sequence this allele. It's not, I don't have a paper for it. So, so far, so good. Okay, so how has this changed what people do? Um, so I think funders, if they are tracking accountability of their money, well now authors have a way, researchers have a way of releasing more of that data to the public and that can be part of that accountability. Can we change that and can we help them to get that part of that accountability? I don't know. Um, that's another conversation. Okay, so there's more um, that a research that a funder can look at. The researcher, you know, it does. They do lots of work. They have other students do it. They have their a staff do it. They get maybe one one or two papers out of project, right? <coughs> well, now they will be acting as data curators, and their students, and their postdocs and staff have an opportunity to be a first author. So normally you have an, a, one paper with a ton of authors. This can actually divide that out and people will get credit, more credit, it's potentially more credit for what they actually do. Okay, a peer reviewer. Well, I think a lot of you already know that there's really limited pools. It's hard to chase them down, difficult to find. We have expanded ours, our pool to include um, more people from our community. Are they interested? Yes, we have 82 people who signed up in being a reviewer at various conferences we've gone to. 18 are postdocs, 10 are graduate students, and other players. Um, we do vet them. We don't just take anybody. We make sure that they have some kind of PI approval. Um, okay, and so this one, I know I'm gonna get wrong and insult people, but you know, you have publishers and you have libraries. Our library has been just key in helping us, and they are our publisher. Um, they facilitate, they're facilitating us in getting into the open access realm, making sure that we're complying with everything. They are guiding us through the indexing applications, and they are our ultimate archiver. And they're really happy about this, I think, so they tell me. Okay, so what about database curators? I love not having anything to do. So we are going to do as much as possible to make it, you know, push this back onto the researchers. Um, but we do become now journal editors. So when we bring on Flybase and, and, and uh, um, yeast, the yeast genome database, they, we will anoint people as editors for their communities. They, you know, all the yeast people are buds, so they can always grab or, you know, get people together. Um, they also become biological copy editors because at the point of submission, we can make sure that they're actually putting in the right name, they're using the right IDs, all this stuff. So I think the data that gets published through this, um, through this platform is gonna be higher quality than things that just go out for a review. I know that for sure because we've just sent things out for review, they come back and no one picks up the fact that somebody used a capital I instead of a lowercase l. It's just horrendous, but we'll catch it now. Um, we become data managers. We're not just people who identify things in papers, which is you know, just not as fun. Um, and also we become um, community curation advocates. So we're bringing in our community, we're training them in this whole new realm of data management and data stewardship. I don't know if I'll ever change us being sorely misunderstood, but that's okay. I'll have less to do so I can complain more. Um, what is the key component? So we think this is really working. We think we're off to a good start. One of the big components I think that has helped us is that we are part of a model organism community. Like I said before, WormBase is the database, the go-to database for nematode researchers, biomedical researchers. They love WormBase. They've always been very supportive of us. And we can ask them, you know, we're we actually come from the community. I've worked with many of those people um, for decades now, so they know me and my name for some reason, some bug just got all over the, the database. So whenever I go, 
you know, my name pops up, and that's it, to my detriment and to the good part of this, um, to help this project. Also, uh, we have, because we're in the Alliance, we can spread easily. So we have other databases looking at us, and we all look at each other, and we all say, oh, that looks really cool, we're going to do that, or oh, oh, we don't like that, so we're going to stay away. But they like this so far. So they already know about it. They're watching us getting it going, and their community also knows about us. Um, the other thing, the final thing is um, we, we are the data stewards. So we can control how that data is made in, made uh, interoperable. We can make sure that all of that, all of that stuff is um, se seen through. We can train more people about it. And this is the obligatory force 11 slide. I'll go on. <laughs> okay. Oops. Okay, so we do have challenges. Um, I think all of you probably already understand what the challenges are, but let me just go over them. Yes, it is hard. Even though our worm uh, community is really um, enthusiastic about us, there are people who don't quite trust a new journal. Right? They want that. They're still in that mindset of um, high impact article. So the way around this, or not around it, but what we are doing is to just increase our outreach, going to site um, visits, going to mini uh, lab meetings that involve a couple, um, like <coughs> five or 10 so labs. We also include people from our community on all the editorial boards. Um, and we initiate a lot of uh, buy-in by getting them to participate as reviewers. Um, the other thing is that researchers need training and creation. So right now, we do have forms that they're filling out that do get turned into articles, but it's not in full operation yet, so we've kind of cheated and sent them templates and just said, fill in, you know, paste your picture here and fill in text here, and then we go and do, do the, the curation work. So getting them used to this isn't really, we're not sure how easy that's going to be so far, but we have implications that it will be okay. And with the cocoa forms, it's going to be massively fun. So we're not worried. Um, with uh, reviewer avail availability. So I'm told that 15 out of 62 scientists declining an offer to review is not that bad. As a newbie, okay, great. We're not doing so bad at all. We're doing fantastic. Um, and we're increasing their viewer pool, and I, people are excited about that. Finally, our biggest hurdle right now is getting indexed. We are working on that. First, we're going for the DOAJ, um, and then we're, we're going to go ahead for the other ones. And I, I think we're guided very nicely by our librarian, so um, I'm not worried either about that. OK, with that, let me finish. Um, this is the team. There's only five of us. This is the worm base. Uh, crew, we are bringing in other people soon. OK, thank you. Uh, it's, you have 10 minutes for questions. I have 10 minutes for questions. Yes. Yeah, you need the microphone. So uh, negative results definitely still have a place in publishing. You're Hang on a second. You, well, you can ask. I'll repeat the question. So uh, negative results still have a place in research, even though it's kind of been diminished in some regards. I guess my two part of the question is, like, of the 53 that have been published, have any of them dealt with negative results? And the second part is, do you feel like this is a good place to maybe researchers to publish negative results instead of a major public like a major journal you know like it, would there be less pressure if they if they were reporting negative results in a micro pub uh, to answer your first question yes we have published a negative result paper um, I think this is a perfect venue for that if it's part of a bigger story then and they want that bigger story out then 
they can publish it there. But publishing in a micropublication doesn't keep you from citing your own negative result in a bigger story. So why not get it out first and keep other people from doing the experiment and then put it into your bigger story later if you want. Uh, yes, uh, great work. Uh, I I get the impression from your talk and from uh, his question that this is mostly uh, for results without a paper. Uh, that said, I, I think even for results that could fit a paper, th th this adds something. I mean, uh, it's definitely easier for doing peer review, as somebody commented before. I mean, it's easier to do a single figure, and you can be much more uh, strict or, and, and careful. And it's definitely good for data creation as well. So I mean, uh, it would be nice if, if you could actually make this not only a place for results without a paper, but results with a paper. Like if you could take a lot of micropubs and, and turn it into like a bigger story, or if you, if you could actually include something from a micropublication in a bigger article, I think it would be great. But uh, of course, that depends on like how the ultimate venue of the article looks at, at this. So I mean, do you see a way out of it? Like uh, to, to OK, this exists, but this could fit in another paper, and it's OK. I mean, how, how, how do you manage that? Yeah, so there's a couple parts to that question. One, like I said, publishing here doesn't keep you from citing it as part of your bigger story. And we do see, you know, my vision is that, you know, everything gets published as you do your science, right? And then, you know, they're just, they could be Lego pieces and you can build stories out of them later. I mean, you just wait till you have that one experiment to tie it together and then you go for your, your big long narrative. The other thing is we do get, we have that problem with authors wanting to write longer papers. And you know, it seems to be age related. You know, the older the <laughs> PI, the longer the story they want to write. And I can't, I can't win that battle with my teammates. But I'm not, yeah, I am pointing at one person who <laughs> argues for longer. But so what we do is we look at that article and we say, you know what, as a curator, I have at least three things to curate in this paper. Each one, in our minds, is a micropublication. So sometimes we say, you know what, we're going to break this up. And so we have done that. Other times, Tim says, no way. This is, you know, I like it the way it is. And so we're still playing around with that, that limit. But um, we have broken up something, and then we pieced it together. So we're playing around with building that Lego block story. Um, and we call it integration which is a terrible name because integration in science also means putting in a transgene and integrating into the genome. So it's confusing and we have to rename it, but we are playing with that, and, but we have to figure out some way of kind of computationally connecting those things so that it's easier to track. And I don't know what to do with data site DOIs at that point because now the two DOIs and one DOI, it just, uh, right. I could have an answer, but I rather want to ask a question, if you don't mind. Wait, do you have enough time? <laughs> and since I'm the timekeeper, yes, we have enough time. <laughs> and, I'm all, <laughs> and I'm also a co-presenter of the next session, so now we have two more minutes or okay. so, and then people want to maybe move to the next. Now, my question is, how does micropublication relate to data papers? Is that a similar thing that in other disciplines that, that there maybe the data paper is a little bit bigger, but it's sort of not so different, or how do you would you All I can say it? is there's no database behind the data paper, right? I mean, you might have metadata capturing it, but the actual data, I mean, that's what's missing. And that's not, you almost, you kind of become a silo if you don't have, you know, a database, you know, like kicking out that data into the public again, right? You, it's kind of, it's just, so that's the big difference, and I think that's why, you know, uh, we're great. I, okay, that, sorry. But, but that's, I think that's the biggest piece that's missing in the scholarly communication is really we have all these repositories that are wonderful, but people need to kind of be told about them. Here, people searching for something will happen across it. So it's, you know, it's a different kind of PubMed. I mean, so, but it is, you know, it's more freeing of the data. Does that answer anything? So my question actually has to do more with credit. Um, 
it's important, obviously, these are research products that we want the researchers to receive credit for. Do you have sort of um, ALMs or something along those lines that shows evidence that these are being used and they can put micropubs on the same sort of level with a traditional journal article or anything else along those lines? Did I mention that I'm totally new to the publishing community? I have no idea what an ALM is. Uh, yes. Oh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Okay. Uh, was my previous job was ALMs at Plus, so the article level metrics. So we try to do the same for data as we heard earlier today. So I think. Yes, we, we yes we do, and we, <laughs> we it's not on our website yet, but we are we'll have that, and we'll. we'll and the other thing we'll do is feed that back to all the players. So that's also kind of missing in this, like authors, you know, do have papers, but you know, how often are they alerted? you know, to all that stuff. Um, obviously, I haven't written enough papers, so I, no one alerts me to stuff. But <laughs> I mean, we, we definitely want to have that flow of information back and forth at every stage. So but yeah. I think my question is related to that. Um, but I was wondering um, if you've gotten any feedback from researchers who have used the micro publications and not just submitted them, whether that's metric wise or just comments. We're too early in the game, I think. Um, we certainly have published micro publications that have cited other micro publications. So, but I, that might be cheating. I don't know. I mean, we can't, we don't know yet. I think it's too early. But there's definitely, um, you know, for one of our sections is methods. And a lot of people are really interested in that. And they've been using methods, the, the, some of the methods that are out there. So that, I think, is going to be cited a lot. So those are going to be, we look at that as really kind of, um, that's going to be a, a test for us as well. OK, thank you.